Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the sixth episode of Central Hampshire Veterans Services. This is our local television show. We talk about things facing veterans in our district here. Um, again, my district um, is goes from Pelham all the way out to Middlefield in the town of Chester. So um, there's many of you there. Uh, if you see this, it should be on most of the town websites. You can also just find us on YouTube. Just put in Central Hampshire Veteran Services. It'll show up. Uh, it's been uh, a long winter. We haven't uh, recorded a show for a few months. Um, back when our last show, episode five, we talked about a lot about the new legislation that came through, uh, the PACT Act. Um, and what it was all about was people who, veterans, um, service members who served in Southwest Asia uh, from the Gulf War on were exposed to a lot of toxins, both in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, in Kuwait. Uh, I'll go through some of the places, but um, people came up with a lot of ailments because of exposure to these toxins, as well as updating some of the things for Vietnam veterans. So that was big legislation, and we've been really busy since that came out because people who were denied previously, now all of a sudden, it's all presumptive. And what that means is if you served in a certain location and you've got a certain health condition, it is decided that you don't have to do much to prove that it was due to your exposure to the toxins that were in that uh, area at that time. Um, so there's a lot of details. Watch episode five, you'll hear more about it. Um, I do want to have a guest um, come onto the show and go into even more detail if we could, uh, but they've been pretty busy up at the VA in Leeds, so I haven't been able to secure anyone for the show, but hopefully maybe next episode. Uh, the other thing is in toxins is the Camp Lejeune water and that's kind of leading me into what I wanted to just briefly talk about today which is the VA healthcare system and eligibility for it and all those toxins so if you meet some of the things I'm going to talk about it means that you are VA health eligible and you can go enroll in VA healthcare your father's generation uh, before Everyone was eligible. If you served during wartime, you were automatically VA health eligible. If you were during peacetime, you were not. Many things changed in the 90s, and more people were eligible, were eligible to um, enroll in VA health care with a certain amount of time, things like that. And there were priority groups, and one through eight were the priority groups. And if you were in priority group eight, you had some co-pays, you had some of that. However, 2003, they took priority group eight and said, yeah, none of you were eligible. So they took it all away. And a year later, I took this job. And what a struggle that was for the Korean War veterans and World War II vets who hadn't enrolled and just were told it would always be there. Well, um, the Congress changed, and they changed it. And the administration said, OK, no more priority group eight. We don't have the money. Um, they then back in 2009 or 11, they included some, but it got means tested. In other words, based on your income and assets. So if you applied back 20 years ago, you weren't eligible. If you applied 10 years ago and you were means tested because your assets were too high, you weren't eligible. Now they've eliminated the asset test, but they still do an income test. And I forgot what the, I think it's like 65% of median income or whatever. I hope to get exact numbers and I'll get that out to you. Um, but it's about if it's a veteran and a dependent and your income is less than 48,000 uh, a year, you would be eligible for VA healthcare. The other things that make you eligible is service connection. Service connection disability comes from being exposed to something, being wounded, loss of arm, all of these things that happen in the service. If you get compensation from the VA, you're automatically put in a priority group and you get VA health care, and it's pretty high up in the priority groups. Not everyone is service connected. 
And that's what I wanted to talk about because they've made VA health eligibility for those who um, were in places don't currently have a service-connected disability and may not even have one of the conditions as of yet and maybe never will, but you are VA health eligible. And I just want to go through them really quickly, and it's all from this legislation from last year. Um, so at least one of these must be true of your active duty service for you to be able to, to enroll. You served in a theater of combat operations during a period of war after the Persian Gulf or you served in combat against the hostile force during a period of hostilities after November 11th, 1998. The reason it says after the Gulf War is those people used to not be eligible, just those that served during the Gulf War. Well, now it's after that. So one of those two things, and the other must be true, you were discharged or released on or after October 1st, 2013. So that would be a lot of career um, service members who retired. They served in the 90s, but they didn't retire until 2013 and they got discharged. Those folks are now automatically eligible for VA health care. Um, then the question, well, what if I was discharged before that October 1st of 2013? Well, they have requirements for that too. Um, you can receive care and enroll during a special enrollment period of October 1st of 2022 to October 1st of 2023. So we've got until October 1st for you to enroll if one of these is true. You served in the theater of combat operations during a period of war after the Persian Gulf or you served in a combat against hostile force during a period of hostilities after November 11th in 1998, same things, but you were discharged or released between September 11th of 2001 and October uh, 1st of 2013, and you haven't enrolled in VA healthcare before. You can now enroll if you haven't ever enrolled before. And so those are opportunities for people to do it. Going back, also um, Vietnam era veterans, it used to be a Vietnam War veteran after all the battles for Agent Orange and some of the other toxins to get those things understood that it came from there. They've now also discovered, oh, well, we were doing some of that same kind of stuff in other places. So any Vietnam War veteran who is boots on the ground or blue water automatically can enroll in VA healthcare, but now also can people who served um, active duty in any of these locations during these time periods. The Republic of Vietnam, as I just said, from 1962 to 1975. Thailand at any U.S. or Royal Thai base from January 9th of 1962 to January 30th of 1976. Laos between December 1st of 65 and September 30th of 1969. Certain provinces in Cambodia uh, between April 16th of 1969 and April 30th of the same year of 1969. Guam or American Samoa um, or their tutorial waters between January 9th of 1962 and all the way to January 31st of 1980. That's important for Navy veterans to know this. And the Johnston Atoll or a ship called, um, that called um, at Johnston Atoll, Atoll between January 1st of 72 and September 30th of 1977, those five years. So that's just more information if you serve during those times and you are automatically now eligible for VA healthcare. You may never come up with one of the conditions and let's hope that doesn't happen, but the VA has recognized that you could have been exposed to a lot of things. Same thing with Camp Lejeune water. Even if you are not suffering from one of the service-connected disabilities from that water. If you were there, you are eligible for VA health care. Um, so those are important things. I know people have seen it on the television, on the radio. There's lawyers out there asking you to please join the lawsuit against the U.S. government and uh, the Camp Lejeune water. 
if you were a civilian who served down there, that's your, that's your best way of getting some compensation for being exposed. If you are a veteran and you have a, a, a cancer that was caused by that or any of the other things that are possible, you could go for the lawsuit, but you're much better off, in my opinion, and I think most would tell you, filing a claim for disability with the VA compensation. It's quick, you will get it, it'll be a monthly income, you'll enroll in VA healthcare, and your family will be protected um, if any of those conditions could cause your death. Um, so if you do the lawsuit, that's gonna take, as the court systems do, that could be 10, 12 years before that's ever even decided and mind you, whatever you win from that, they're going to take a cut up to 40% um, would go to the, to the lawyers who did the case. Plus, if you had any of those conditions and you got treated in a hospital, the insurance company that paid for your care in that hospital can come back to you and say, oh, well we paid for this and now you want a lawsuit, so you owe us that money back. So, uh, you might want to think twice about doing it as a, if you are a military person, if you served and are a veteran, and it was in Camp Lejeune, you might want to think twice about going after the lawsuit and rather just go to compensation with the VA. That's what I wanted to make sure I updated everybody on from my last show, um, all those disability claims, but this is saying that you are VA health eligible even if you don't have any of those conditions at this time. If you serve there, you can go up there, it's real easy, you can contact us at the office and we will help you apply for um, VA health. Thank you. Now I'd like to move on to uh, this month's guest. Um, many years ago, I was working in the office and I was approached by a reverend of the Episcopal Church who did a lot of outside, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Ministry, thank you. And his, uh, well, I'll let him tell you how it kind of came to, but he came and met me and we had kind of meeting of the minds. Um, he's also my doppelganger, is that what they call those? Yeah, um, I know because I'll walk down Main Street and people go, hey, Reverend Chris, and I'll go, who, nobody's ever called me a reverend before, but I know who they're speaking of. So um, our show highlighting today is um, Building Bridges Veterans Initiative. And it is about what we've done for years now, um, providing a, a, an opportunity for veterans to get together. And I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, who's the director, and the assistant director is Chad Wright. So um, Chris Carlisle, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Thanks yeah. for this opportunity. It's, it's really a, a privilege to be able to get uh, the word out about Building Bridges because it's really been a wonderful ride for me and for Chad um, over these now uh, eight years. Uh, the, believe it or not, that first meeting that you and I had um, was in 2015. My uh, bishop um, was elected and uh, and came into office with a priority um, of, of addressing the needs of veterans and was, um, uh, and, and that interest came by way of his having been uh, the rector of an Episcopal church outside the gates of West Point. Um, he had many cadets in the pews, but one of the things that he recognized was that for all um, uh, the cadets out there who are fairly well benefited, what about the millions of veterans who are not? So, um, and yes, if you think about eight years ago, these wars were just starting, well, one was wrapping up, the other one was still going on, so. <coughs> right. Yeah. So, uh, so he asked me um, uh, what, uh, to come up with an idea, and we had several um, uh, ideas that uh, didn't come to fruit because of their expense and, and logistical complications. And so um, uh, I had had a lot of experience seeing uh, how magnetic uh, eating was to gathering communities of people uh, and have worked outside uh, of the parish for a long time. 
So um, I came to you, as you know, and um, asked uh, whether you thought this was an, a good idea. And you said, maybe, um, uh, that you'd had one attempt um, that didn't really work out. And, uh, but you, you were willing to take the gamble, Steve, and greatly appreciated for that. And so we started the first uh, uh, lunch, a weekly lunch in Northampton the, at the then World War II Club, which was a wonderful um, venue. And uh, for the first several months, saw a pretty slow up, uptick um, of just a handful of veterans. And then suddenly, when we hit the threshold of 30 or so, um, it really took off. Um, I, I, I always remember about that because I tell the story of you know the first week that we had it. Um, you and Allie were down there with a couple of volunteers, and I was cooking because I knew the kitchen and I was trained and stuff. And we had one veteran show up, and the following week, I remember Allie calling me up, going. Um, Steve, are, are we having the lunch today? We're all down here. And I went, <laughs> I forgot all about it. And that same vet showed up and I didn't have lunch. And I think I ran and got pizza or something. <laughs> but, and then, yeah, then it really grew a little bit after well, that and after that, <clears throat> yep. So by contrast, now we have, I believe, 13, uh, 13 sites across Massachusetts, as far east as Swansea. Um, we've got two out of state, one in, Keene, one in Brattleboro, with, um, with probably several more happening, including one in, in Rhode Island in the spring. Um, and we're seeing 800 to 1,000 veterans a month. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's really been a wonderful and, and gratifying experience. But essentially, uh, our mission is to address uh, veteran uh, social isolation, depression, suicide risk. Uh, and so the, um, the invitation is always uh, to a veteran and a guest or family member, um, recognizing how important friends and families are to, to the um, wholeness and, and, and health of, of veterans. Um, <clears throat> and it's really been, uh, we think, and we've, uh, well, on the basis of, of surveys that we've taken, we, we have seen what an impact uh, building bridges um, as an initiative has had on on our population and, and again very very gratified by it um, and uh, and the idea is essentially um, to formulate um, these sites form these sites um, provide a good uh, meal either a breakfast a lunch or din a dinner um, and then to really get out of the way allow veterans to um, to be comrades and to and to experience the healing between between uh, between themselves between veterans and uh, well, an important part of that is, you know, uh, there was a big realization six seven years ago. Um, I that's when it really came out into the public of twenty two veterans were committing a suicide per day in this country and people were like, oh my God, that was so much higher than the normal rate. And so people were talking about addressing it. And that was, you know, I mean, we knew it 15 years ago, um, but, you know, it really became known to the public. And that was about the same time you were doing the lunch. And it met it really perfectly. Now, working in the field, the national government through the VA has realized that it's an important thing that's happening and, and trying to address, you know, veteran suicide. And they've been throwing money at it. And there's different people running around working. But I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's what you guys created, which is camaraderie. Veterans like to hang out with other veterans, share some stories, and sometimes have stories nothing about their service, but just there's a trust, there's a camaraderie. Yeah, I mean, we sometimes joke uh, uh, about um, how embarrassingly simple the, the formula is, which is to simply get out of the way and allow veterans uh, to engage in healing amongst themselves. Jonathan Shea, who is a sort of leading uh, psychologist in uh, veteran health uh, from Harvard, who's actually since moved out to the western part of the state, 
um, uh, has done enormous amounts of research and therapy with veterans. And he says just this, he said, you know, uh, as, as equipped as we think we are as psychotherapists and researchers and so on, uh, the, the real genius in the process of healing uh, for veterans resides with the veterans themselves. And I think we've, we've found that, right? Right. Ted? It's definitely every, we don't want to say every meal is like group therapy, but there is something about having the numbers there um, as a support system, um, a, a network for veterans. Um, I think within the next month we're going to hit our 80,000th meal served. Um, and so that says a lot, you know, I'm, I'm all about the numbers and, you know, if, especially the 22 veterans a day that, you know, commit suicide. So, you know, our formula works. Um, we're trying to overall improve a veteran's mental health and wholeness. Um, just like Reverend Chris said, um, you know, just uh, creating an environment, you know, producing a, a hot, fresh meal um, and getting out of the way. Um, it really works. Well, and I'm always struck because, you know, I w really loved what we were we had created down at the World War II Club, and then COVID hit, and that place had closed, and and it's now a cheese factory of some sort. I, I'm not sure, um, but you know, COVID hit, and you guys went through the. I, I remember you were serving lunches for people to drive up and get them, and and even that worked in some ways because at one time you were getting picked up at the Gazette. And I remember one guy stopping and saying, hey, did such and such come through for lunch? And Ed said, yeah, yeah, he was through. Oh, all right, I hadn't heard from him. So they were always checking on each other, even if it was just through a drive through lunch. That, that's how strong the network became. And the other thing that, and I've said it before, uh, I was listening to NPR, and they went over to an assisted living facility here in Northampton, and they were interviewing people what it felt like to be during the lockdown. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the women were like, I miss my grandchildren. Oh, they can't, I can't see them or my kids, so on and so forth. And they interviewed one gentleman and he said, I'm a World War II vet. He said, and what I miss really badly is Wednesday having lunch with all my buddies at the World War II Club with all the veterans. He said, I don't know how they're doing and I miss them terribly. That told me that what you guys had created was working. I mean, just that that's what he was missing so much. That kind of connection is made between people who want to have connection and, and you just give them the vehicle to do it. So um, yeah, it's, it's great. And it's pretty much, uh, how do you put the, the kind of food you make? You, comfort food, a comfort Right, lunch, comfort right? food, that's exactly right. Um, Your meatloaf is famous, by the way. Uh, thank you. From chickpea all the way to greenfield, uh, that I've heard. Uh, the, the chicken bacon Alfredo is getting right up there, giving it a run for its money. Um, no, today, in fact. Today, in fact, right, in, in Keene, New Hampshire. A rave reviews. Um, no, it's, you know, it's all about the menu, the planning, the logistics, um, and just listening to what the veterans want. And so, um, you know, we always include a nice healthy salad with every meal. Um, and like you said, something that you would get at one of your local hometown diners. Right. And a growing edge now, uh, uh, you know, what, what we have found is that, you know, where there's, where there's need, where there's energy, there's, poss there's possibility. Right. And, um, and we found that one site begets the next site, but also, and, and this is, you know, again, thanks to uh, Storyteller X, which, you know, you initiated and we hosted at uh, Building Bridges uh, Northampton and also the one in Greenfield, um, <clears throat> we are realizing how important um, not only therapeutic it, uh, it uh, not only how therapeutic it is to be able to tell your story, but also to be able to share it with other veterans and listen to others' uh, stories. And so our growing edges now, um, we are sort of considering maybe a quarterly outdoor experience. Uh, in fact, just today we were talking to some people about, um, about logistics and where and so on. Um, but an outdoor experience around a fire probably in the evening in which um, veterans would have the opportunity um, to tell their stories and also to engage in some kind of healing experience. The way that Building Bridges really um, works is that not only do we have to think about the role as hosts, but also veterans themselves come, come in 
and and have uh, I ideas under themselves and the um, idea of a healing experience uh, came by way of um, a Vietnam era B-52 bomber pilot who had lived in Colorado and had just moved to uh, to the Berkshires recently um, who talked about having done that he's he's adoptive Lakota and an indigenous Hawaiian and um, made the uh, remark that, you know, in indigenous cultures, the ritual of coming back home and being welcomed with open arms was, was critical to the whole uh, culture itself. And in this culture, we don't have anything like it. And so uh, we're hoping that a next uh, step for building bridges is to have outdoor experiences, perhaps uh, uh, quarterly in the evening around a fire in which uh, veterans would have the opportunity to both tell stories and to be welcomed back into the community even uh, these 50 years later. Right, you, you know, it, it, and I've been struggling this since I took over this job 19 years ago, that, you know, when I was growing up, the Vietnam veteran was coming home and they weren't welcomed very well at all. I mean, there was just a distaste for the war, um, there, it was just, it was a really hard time to have served and come home because you did not feel appreciated. Uh, very different than the ticker tape parades that happened in World War II and stuff like that. But the other thing, and, and it, was a, it, it was a blemish on our history that the way the Vietnam veteran was treated, but the weird thing is, is I can find veterans today that have come home who feel that same self of, isolation and it's not because it's not the same as the Vietnam vet who you know they said well you were all baby killer you know whatever the 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 group think back then was it's there's not other veterans around they're not noticed we have less and less people serving it's one-fifth of the population excuse me not one-fifth point zero five so less than half of a percent of those serving, so the rest of the community doesn't even know them. And you know, you could go by and say, thank you for your service. That doesn't change their isolation. So whether you put them up on a pedestal or put them down here, depending on your political point of view or whatever your feelings are, they're still isolated, unlike other times. And I think that's really important because they never really do feel that welcome to come back, even if they're serving in these last couple of wars. And so that sounds like that would go a long way of just giving. And, and not every story has to be recorded, but it, it needs to be heard. Mm. It needs to be heard. And it's a great misunderstanding, you know, too, that, um, that people, uh, civilians, uh, know what the politics of veterans are. The politics of veterans are as diverse as the veterans, and 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 that's diverse. That means diverse, and um, and so you know our our policy is to leave politics at the tr at the at the door, uh, and, and to simply come in as as comrades. And uh, and you know that has been a real um, the the creation of um, of an open neutral space has generated a kind of trust. That um, whereby the work the work gets done. It's definitely where the rubber meets the road. You come to a meal, and um, definitely spirits are definitely lifted. Yeah. So back to the actual meal sites, and and well, where can they go to find out where they are and what days? You okay. Guys have so a website. Yes, we have our website. You can go to www.buildingbridgesveterans.org, and on there we have our monthly calendar. And then we have a list of the volunteers, um, our support team, and all the meal sites and uh, what days of the month that they happen. So, and uh, I mean, the, the heart, I mean, it's really great, but some of your locations are just once a month. Um, and because you're spread a little thin, you're one Chad. But um, we used to have it weekly in Northampton when the World War II closed, it, it went to twice a month. And it's the first and third Wednesday, correct? First and third Wednesday of yeah. every month at the uh, spare time bowling alley in Northampton. So veterans can come out and get a hot, fresh, healthy, home-cooked meal and then do some free bowling after. There you go. And then they can go to their chiropractor after. No. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's really good news because I know I've been around town and people are like, well, where is it now? 
So it is at the bowling alley. It is twice a month. Um, and, and it's a growing, it's a, uh, it, it, after, after, you know, sort of uh, tapering off during uh, the pandemic, um, we were thinking, geez, is it going to come back? And, and just last week, it came back with a, a wonderful vengeance. Yes. Very, very and, vibrant. Yeah, and uh, I was talking with some folks up at the VA. There's a, with the women's program, they're interested in coming down as well. So that'll be great. But you also, I mean, we've done it a few times. Um, we're going to come back in March with our, um, our brunch, correct? Yeah. So um, that started this last fall, right? That's right, for the LGBTQ plus uh, community um, specifically, but all veterans are welcome um, at the Majestic uh, Restaurant in downtown Northampton, Sunday morning, mm -hmm. 10 to 12. And yep. Chad, is, Chad is doing a pretty... Uh, Impressive uh, spread. Brunch, yes. brunch yep. Yep. The, the, yeah. the third Sunday of every month, come down to the Majestic, and um, it's the same as uh, the prerequisite. The same as every one of our sites. Just bring yourself, or bring yourself and a guest, and, and come and enjoy the atmosphere and be part of it. Yeah, and uh, and before the show, I asked Chad how he felt about me being able to come down and maybe somebody else who went through this process, but those that. Um, the good old days of don't ask, don't tell. There were certain um, service members who, it was almost like blackmail. Like, you either do what I want you to do or else I'm going to tell them you're gay. And that happened to a lot of service members. And they were then released from the service. And many times it was with a general discharge under honorable conditions. They didn't kick you out with a bad paper, but it wasn't honorable service. Um, but that has changed. And now anybody can serve. I mean, there some limitations were put back on. But all those people who had that put on their discharges, their DD-214s is what they're called, um, they can all have that changed. It all will come back and it'll say, honorable discharge, and they'll get rid of this whole, you know, description that you're a bad person because you were gay. And uh, so I, I would like to go to the brunch in March and talk to anybody who wants to talk about it. I will bring a veteran who also this happened to, and she was able to get hers overturned. It's a, it's a, it's a not very difficult process at all, and our office will help with that. So hopefully, if you guys will let us, uh, be, I'd like to make that a... We'd, we'd love it. And I know that there's different ones, whether it was Northampton or up in Greenfield, that every once in a while you let people just come and talk about what's happening in the veteran world and what they do working with veterans. But that doesn't happen at every lunch. I mean, right. that can happen. Again, when, there, when it seems like there's need, then we... Then we uh, you know, we invite uh, uh, people to, to, to address that need. Otherwise, um, no agenda except uh, being comrades and, and, uh, and having a good lunch, having some, some Chad Wright cooking. Well, we like to call it light programming. Um, you know, once every, you know, for, especially for the, um, the weeklies, you know, once every five or six weeks, maybe we'll have a, a, a speaker come in and talk about something veteran specific, veteran related. Um, but beyond that, no, it's all about the meal and the camaraderie. Yeah, it, it really is an amazing thing and, and you guys created a, a great opportunity for veterans just to connect with each other. Um, now that I live in the Berkshires, I have to shoot up for Monday if I have a Monday off that happens the same time as the lunch. But um, yeah, so I, I'm really glad you both came. Remember folks, if you're at all interested, it, it's give the website again. www buildingbridgesveterans.org. Yeah, so go to that website, find out where there's a lunch, um, where there's an opportunity for you to go. If you know of somebody, you know, you've got an older veteran in your neighborhood and you, you're, you're worried or you feel like they're feeling isolated, you know, tell them to come on down to the lunch. Bring them down with you. We'll, we'll feed you as well if you bring them with you. Um, the other thing is, is that I know different sites, you still, still can use some volunteers. We lost two special volunteers in Northampton to that terrible car accident out in East Hampton. But, um, but yeah, so if you're at all interested in wanting to help provide lunch to these folks, Chad is all certified. 
He's the overseer of it, but you can volunteer and help him get that done, help serve and all of it. And Bruce is always there, and Richard's there, so that's great. So yeah, so thank you again both for coming. I appreciate your, uh, your coming in and talking about it. And uh, I just want to end today's show by letting you know you're going to start seeing this around. This was done. It was supposedly going to go out in the Gazette um, on Veterans Day this past year. And there was all kinds of um, confusion, and it got a little bit messed up. But we now have this resource guide for the coming year. We'll probably do one next year as well. But it's updated about all the things that veterans can, you know, go to learn about, learn about women veterans. It, there's, it's full of good information. Look at some of your American legions. Go to the libraries. You're going to see the, this magazine, this uh, insert um, around most all of the district. I'm going to get it to different places around in Amherst, up in Bergey, out in Chester. So um, look for it. Um, share the information on it. And remember, if you know of a veteran who is in need, whether it's financial, emotional, spiritual, call our office, our number, 413-587-1299, and just let us know um, if you, as a veteran, family member, or even a neighbor, if, if you know of somebody who needs it, we're here to serve them. Um, if you don't know the towns, I'll go through them really fast. Pelham, Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, Williamsburg, Goshen, Cummington, Chesterfield, Worthington, Chester, and Middlefield. Um, whew, I remember them all. So if you're in any of those communities, and if you're not even in those communities, there's a VSO in every city and town in the state of Massachusetts. Get in touch with them. They're there to help. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks for watching today, and we will see you next month. Thanks so much. Thank you.